have my phone with me so I don't run over time, because I know, I know I have a time limit here, and I'm trying to do something complicated. I'm trying to talk intelligently and play well. I may talk well and play intelligently. We'll see how it goes. Uh, thank you, Ramona, for the introduction. Uh, I did a, a, a slightly different version of this last year, and I really enjoyed it, and people asked if I would do this again. And so I'm doing it here today in Brooklyn, and I'm going to do it in a few weeks in Patchog on our other campus. So you are the guinea pigs. You get to hear me uh, do this for the first time. I'm going to be uh, also playing some different pieces from last year. Last year I played a series of mazurkas, which are very uh, beautiful but relatively small works by Chopin. Today I'm going to play some small works and some large works. Um, and if you looked at the, the preview about this talk, uh, the title is something like uh, Chopin, who was he? Why is his music still so powerful today? Um, of all the composers, I think Chopin may be one of the most beloved. Um, how many of you have been to Paris? All right, so a lot of you have been to Paris. How many of you have been to the grave of Chopin? All right, some of you have been to the grave. And what, what did the grave look like? Were there any flowers on the grave? Oh, yeah, tons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah almost as many as Jamar. Yeah, almost as many. <laughs> so, you know, to me, that, is, that speaks volumes. When you go to the grave of someone, and they've been dead for, you know, almost 200 years, uh, and there are still flowers on the grave, people are still making a pilgrimage to that grave, then that says something about that person's music that it has a universal quality because people from all over the world hear Chopin and they love it. They enjoy hearing it. So today I'm going to be playing some of his most famous pieces, but I know that many of you are sophisticated listeners. You know quite a bit about Chopin already and you know quite a bit about music. So you never want to talk down to your audience. So I'm going to throw in some complexity here as I talk about this because I know that that's something that people love and deserve from me. Uh, in fact, as president, I talk about this a lot, that although our students don't always want to admit it, what they really want is depth. They really want to go deeply into things. They don't want to be superficial. They want to really dive into the problems and issues of the day. They want to really understand their disciplines. And they want to get something out of their classes that is beyond the superficial. And so today I'm going to try a little bit of that with you because I'm that kind of person. I can't really play this music and talk about it without having a deep relationship to it. There's a, a, a really wonderful book uh, uh, from 1927, which probably only uh, Leon and I know, uh, <laughs> which is by a, a musicologist named uh, Knud Jeppesen. He was a Danish musicologist. And the book is called Palestrina and the style of the dissonance. And the reason I mention this book is that it's a whole book about the composer Palestrina in the viewpoint of how he handled dissonance. And dissonance in music is when two notes sound like they may not go together and they can be resolved. And how Palestrina approached every single note and every single dissonance led to the development of something that was later called counterpoint one note against another. So for example, a typical dissonance. And then to resolve it. Right. So that dissonance holds you up, suspends you in the air, and then it's resolved. And Palestrina, being from the 16th century, he had a very, very exact and scientific way of approaching it. Well, Chopin's music is absolutely full of dissonance. Although we think of him as this wonderful romantic composer with this beautiful operatic style, which he was, but his music actually, if you really start to listen to it, is filled with very sharp and disturbing sounds. 
And those sounds are emanation, an emanation of his soul because he was a very deep person and a very complex person. Even in his smallest works, that comes out. So I'm going to start off today by playing a couple of preludes. Chopin wrote a series of preludes throughout his life, but the most famous set, there are 24 of them in the major and minor keys, was composed mostly while he was on an island uh, with his lover, Georges Sand, um, and he was very, very ill. Uh, he had a miserable piano to play on, <clears throat> and he was uh, exiled to the outskirts of the city because everyone knew that he had tuberculosis and they didn't want him infecting anyone. Uh, and he wrote a series of stunning pieces. And so I'm going to play two of them. Uh, the first one is in C minor. The second one is in E minor. You'll recognize both of them. And as you listen to them, see if you can hear some of the interesting dissonances and, and the way that Chopin is handling them. Because that is what really is giving his music a kind of life and intensity that is so unique to Chopin. You could, hear, you could hear those notes that were kind of crashing against each other, and then they would slowly resolve as uh, the, the scale of the piece started to go downward. He also, of course, is exploring all the different timbres of the piano, not only the very high, but the very low, the very loud, and the very soft. I always tell my piano students, if you play Chopin, it will make you a better pianist, because you just can't play it badly. If you play it badly, everyone notices. <laughs> so it's pretty hard to play it badly. You just instinctively back off and say, wow, that sounds bad, right? <laughs> so you're really pushed as a musician to explore your musicality and to develop yourself. And it's really interesting. As much as I love Chopin and get into him, for me to perform Chopin, I have to get to know myself. So it's a little bit like the journey all of our students go through right now, that, that sense of self-discovery. On the one hand, you go deeply into the world of the subject of Chopin's music, but in order to really unlock it and to play it well, you must go into your own soul. You must bear something of your own soul. It's very uncomfortable when you start out, as a young person in particular. It's the last thing you really want to do. But the great artists, whether they're musicians, visual artists, poets, whatever they're doing, dancers, they are bringing something beyond just the subject matter. They're bringing themselves to it. This second prelude is another example of the beautiful approach to dissonance that Chopin had. Uh, it's also one of the most famous pieces he wrote. So well known that actually when he died in 1849, it was performed at his funeral.
One of the uh, uh, drawbacks of being married to a musician is that you have to listen to him practice constantly. <laughs> And Paula, my wife, who's here today, Paula, why don't you stand up so people can see you? She's, no, she's not standing up. She's sitting right over there. Um, we had this discussion a few years ago when I was the Dean of Music and Fine Arts in New Orleans, and I had been working for about a year on a, on a titanic project. I was playing the complete Goldberg variations of Johann Sebastian Bach. And uh, if you're into Bach and music, you know that that is kind of the... the, the uh, one of the pinnacles of keyboard work, and I had to just practice like a crazy person. And uh, she had to listen to this. And she was very, very supportive, and then, but when the event was over, she came to me and she said, I never want you to play Bach. <laughs> and she said, could you possibly play something nice, <laughs> like Chopin? And so I have performed, and, uh, and I know that these are pieces that she loves and they're pieces that I grew up listening to. My mother was a great music lover and these are exactly the types of pieces that, that made her fall in love with Chopin and love this style. Uh, the next two pieces are nocturnes. One is an E flat, one is an F minor. These are pieces that are intended to be atmospheric. They would have been performed at night in the salon. Uh, Chopin rarely played events like this. He would be horrified of me doing this. Uh, this is just not the world that he was used to. So he was used to being in a beautiful salon. Uh, people might have been drinking or eating, uh, but they may have just come back from a night at the opera house. Uh, there was a very, very dim candlelight. In fact, it's uh, reported that Chopin frequently asked that the candles be uh, blown out so that he could play in total darkness. Uh, so these are pieces that are intended to be evocative not only of the evening, the nocturne, but also of the memories and associations people have with life. Each of you has an imagination. As you listen to these pieces, you may put yourself into a particular scene. I certainly do as I play. I never talk about those things because they're very personal to me. But I can assure you that when I play, there's definitely a movie going on up here, right? There's something happening. I'm thinking about things that have affected me throughout my life, and that brings a power to the performance. So, uh, I'm going to play two nocturnes. One is in E flat and then one in F minor.
Nocturne I played was written when Chopin was 20. So how many of you out there are 20 right now? <laughs> some of you are. I know some of you are 20. Thank you, Leon. Leon. Imagine that. Imagine the genius. But I, I say this to our students all the time. Don't let those around you or what the world tells you, don't let that limit you. There's an incredible amount that you can do at a young age. 
don't think that just because you're a student, that you're 20, you're 19, and the world's not paying any attention, don't think for a moment that you cannot create incredible things. In this case, a piece that will probably last down through the centuries. Most of the pieces I'm playing today were written by Chopin when he was in his 20s. This last piece I'm going to play, the Ballade in G minor, was written while he was a student in Vienna. Um, he was there for a couple of different trips. He completed this piece when he finally arrived in Paris, but most of it was written while he was in Vienna, so he was certainly in his early 20s when he composed it. It's one of his most famous works, the Ballade in G minor. Um, it's an extensive work. It's one of a set of four ballades. And of course, Chopin being Chopin, he calls the work a ballade. And a ballade, is, as most people in literature would know, is a poem. It's not a piece of music. Uh, so obviously, this is a piece of music that tells a story. But again, it's not a story that we know, but it's a story that we can come to know through our own experiences. Uh, I think that that's one of the reasons why this piece has had such an incredible life uh, is the fact that almost anyone can listen to it and relate to it. So as you listen to it, you'll also hear the trademark dissonances, all of those wonderful things uh, that make Chopin's music special. Now, as the phone continues to play, uh, I, am reminded of, I am reminded of a story um, when I was in New Orleans, uh, I was at a performance of the New Orleans uh, Symphony, and the guest flautist was James Galway, right? And all of you, and I actually had a chance to get to know Mr. Galway because he came to Loyola frequently and he used to work with our students, and, and uh, he was just a charming, he's just as charming off camera as he is on camera. Uh, and he has a real penchant for really dirty jokes, just if you meet him. Uh, but he was going to perform a Mozart flute concerto, and uh, he got up to the audience and says, now before I start playing, I want you to all turn off your cell phones, because there's nothing more disturbing to me as a musician than having a cell phone go off while I'm performing. And he made that very clear. He could be very stern. And they started. They were getting right to the point of the cadenza in the first movement where he's just solo going to, you know, burst forth and a phone went off. <laughs> and the expression on his face was just, you know, priceless. And then he stopped and, and he actually took his flute and he laid it on a stand next to him and he slowly opened his vest and took out his phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I just... So if your phone goes off, trust me, you're, you're in good company. It's not the end of the world. Okay. So Chopin's Ballade in G minor. Uh, I hope you enjoy it.
Any questions? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. It's a tremendous piece, uh, you know, for pianists. That's one of the works that you know we always dream of playing as as young people. And as you get older, then you're able to do it. Uh, but when I was uh, a college student, I remember that piece was far, far out of my range. And so now I'm really happy that I can play it and I can share it with you. I hope you've enjoyed the playing and the talking today. <laughs> And, I, and I, thank, I thank you, too, for supporting our college. There are a lot of students here today, but there are also some, some very, very important alumni with us today, some people that have given a lot of their treasure and talent to this college to make it the special place it is, and in whose tradition I am just a small part. And so today is a real wonderful gathering. You have the great alums from the past. You have the future students sitting here in the front. <laughs> And I thought they did really well, yes. right? Yes. Much better than my nieces and nephews. <laughs> so I thank all of you for being here and for sharing this moment with me and for being a part of such a wonderful college. It's just its so delightful to watch St. Joseph grow and thrive and do well at the thing that we do best, which is to be and not to seem. We really are a school that is. It doesn't look like a school. It really is a school. Our students don't just look like students. They really are students. Our professors don't just look like professors. They really are professors. And so we're so thrilled to come together like this and have these moments. Thank you so much for today.